Good morning. Just to clarify, I'm Dana. This is Patrick. We get mistaken for each other all the time. I know we look a lot alike, but both really tall. So I just wanted to clarify to start off. So we're going to be talking today about exercise and Parkinson's disease. Basically, our objectives for today are to teach you about all the benefits of exercise. I know we're biased, but that's our, that's our goal, to get you as excited as we are, to discuss the exercise options in your community, and to provide you with exercise ideas that you can even start today. So to start off, raise your hand if you are currently involved in some sort of exercise regimen. Well, Patrick, we can go. They don't need us. They look at it all. <laughs> Uh, nope, you're going to listen to us anyway. Sorry. Hopefully, we can give you some better or some other suggestions, not that in addition to what you're doing now. So, some. Uh, oh, I get to move. How do you change the slide from here? Oh, that worked. Okay. So, some common movement issues associated with Parkinson's disease are bradykinesia, which means basically slow movement. Shuffling gait pattern, so not picking up your feet when you walk. A forward posture, like kind of a lean forward. Retroversion, or also called retropulsion, which means you tend to fall backwards. Like catch yourself, but fall backwards, lose your balance backwards. Micrographia, or like small writing. Difficulty performing fine motor tasks, like buttoning a button, um, zipping up a coat. Uh, and freezing, or what, what you mean by that is like difficulty starting a movement, like I uh, can't figure out how to get started walking. Okay, so the importance of exercise. Some, some you'll definitely know. Uh, to prevent a poor gait pattern, so to try and break those tendencies, like the shuffling, freezing gait pattern, to maintain and improve your standing balance. So Parkinson's, as we all know, is a progressive disorder. So sometimes the goal is to help us learn, learn strategies to keep us where we're at right now, and, or maybe slow it down from, getting, from our movement disorders getting worse. Improve our core strength, and that is linked to preventing the bad posture. Prevent weakness in general. Usually we don't see muscle strength weakness right away. So it's hard to know if the muscle weakness is due to inactivity or fear of moving. And so you just become generally deconditioned from not moving because it doesn't really seem to be, oh, you have Parkinson's, so you must be weak. It's not really it. It's more just due to lack of movement, lack of participating in exercise. Uh, it, participating in exercise has been found to decrease incidence in depression, improve your mood. That is really common in Parkinson's disease. Lower your incidence of falls. In general, we want to prevent falls because the more often you fall, the more likely you are for injury and life can get really poor after that if you sustain too significant of an injury. And also improve your quality of sleep. So types of exercises to consider. You might be favoring one of these or maybe a combination of all three. It's, um, no, there's no one right exercise, but one more, probably more common, people more commonly participate in aerobic exercise or cardiovascular conditioning, not just because it, it helps with Parkinson's, but it improves your cardiovascular health, and which is also related to aging. Walking, boxing, swimming, rowing, dancing, all these are examples of aerobic exercise. Strength or resistance training, another pretty common one. Uh, push up, like we think of strength training, we think of like push-ups, lunges, but there are so many other options. We like to use resistance bands to help with that. It tends to be a good way to make it easier or harder depending on your particular level of ability. And then stretching. Yoga is really popular, Tai Chi, Pilates. Uh, later on today, we're going to show you some just common stretches that we give a lot to patients with Parkinson's disease, but a gen just a general daily stretching program. So how do you get involved with exercise? The best way to start, if you're just not sure, 
is to go to the website we've included on this screen, parkinsonsmi.org, and you can actually search for local exercise groups in, by your zip code in your area. Uh, if you're not tech savvy, or you can't get someone to help, uh, we recommend contacting like your local YMCA or rec center. There's also more and more Parkinson's disease support groups popping up, the more all over the place. Uh, receiving a referral to see an occupational or physical therapist is a great idea. However, I do recommend that you contact, a if you're considering a clinic near you and you're not sure if they treat neurological disorders, I highly recommend that you call first because a lot of, pa a lot of physical therapy clinics primarily only treat patients with orthopedic conditions. So they're not gonna understand your specific needs. So if you just call the front desk at any clinic, they should be able to let you know if they treat patients with neurological disorders. Also, local senior centers. I did not even hit anything that time. <laughs> um, also, if you uh, contact like a local senior center, you might be able to find somebody for just uh, through word of mouth. Uh, so everyone asks us how hard they need to be working out. Like, all right, what is the bare minimum that I need to do to make you all happy? We get that like multiple times a day. <laughs> so really, Parkinson's disease has been found. Since Parkinson's disease slows your movements and slows your gait pattern, the best, most effective exercises tend to be programs that involve quicker, faster, bigger movements, but really any exercise that you do is helpful. That, that's our main take home message today is please just move more. But because I wanna answer your question, the recommended, with people with Parkinson's should engage in at least two and a half hours of exercise every week, which is about a half an hour, five days a week. And we didn't talk about this before the presentation, so also, it helps. Um, and also, the, some of the exercises that we're gonna talk about later on today, but things you might wanna consider, because we do live in Michigan, are indoor options, because ice is not our friend. So, and there's a lot of it for half the year. So, um, that should be something you should consider, as if there might be an indoor option to, for exercise for you. Turn it over to Patrick next, maybe. Okay, so I think it's this button, right? Uh-oh. That is how I had been. There you go. There we go. Oh. Does it go the other direction? Because we lost our slide. There we go. Good morning. So uh, why do we do all these things, right? So we talked about intensity, and we talked about frequency, and we talked about what we're going to do. But the question is, why are we spending two and a half hours per week doing some of these activities? And the overall answer is to improve quality of life. Um, when you look at the research, it shows that, uh, when you look at the research on Parkinson's disease, it shows that a lot of the uh, participants report much improved quality of life related um, benefits, such as improved gait patterns, improved sleep quality, improved well being, improved social functioning. And all those have been uh, directly correlated to improved exercises or increased exercise participation. And then we've talked about a lot of the, the physical aspects of Parkinson's disease. We know the bradykinesias, we know the slowed gait patterns and some of the, the stuff that looks like weaknesses. But what I want to spend a second on is executive functioning. Um, that is also a deficit that occurs in, in uh, Parkinson's disease and can be, can be assisted with exercise. So executive functioning relates to one's ability to successfully plan, organize, and carry out day-to-day -day tasks. And 50% of the patients diagnosed with Parkinson's disease experiences challenge with executive functioning. So what exactly is executive functioning? It's a bunch of higher level cognitive processes that kind of come together that allow us to do everything we need to do throughout the day. So it encompasses memory, this, our processing speed, our attention, our focus, our mental flexibility, and our creativity. Um, I'd like to spend a second on attention because that's one of the things I see as, um, in my day-to-day -day practice, is a big deficit in some of my patients. 
and um, use an example that happened just last week. So we were doing an exercise, it was a balance-based exercise, and we were doing standard counting, so counting by one up to 10. We got through the first exercise, great. We changed things up, instead of counting by one, we started counting by two. So two, four, six, eight, all the way up to 20. Well, I noticed right away that the balance began to change in this exercise, and I actually had to step in and provide physical assist so my patient could maintain balance. And then we, we finished, we got through the exercise, he was kind of frustrated on his performance because the first one went so well. So what we did was we tried it again, this time focusing on balance. Well, his balance looked great, but the counting suffered. So we got to about four, and we had to re resort to counting by ones again. So that's just a very good example of, of that divided attention with that ability to multitask when it comes to deficits in Parkinson's disease. So improving executive functioning. So the parts of your brain that help you organize, plan, multitask are the same centers in your brain that help you apply motor functions. So for example, when you go out to do an exercise, you have to do a lot of higher level planning just for the motor movement itself. Your brain has to organize what it's gonna do. It has to coordinate the movement. It actually has to execute the movement. And those same centers that, that are activated during exercise are the same centers that help you with your executive functioning throughout your day. So how do we train these centers? So one, when we start to look at exercise and we start to look at physical activity, we want to focus on skill-based activity. So things that might challenge our brains, things that might challenge us more than just our typical exercise patterns. And then we want to change up our exercise routines. So that means if we're a person that does a daily biking routine or we go to the gym and do the same routine every day, we want to switch that up. We don't want to keep being stuck in the same ruts. Just doing exercise is great, but we want to challenge ourselves. We want to get better. So how do we do that? We learn a new sport or activity. You can learn new sports or activity. You can do high impact stuff, like maybe a basketball or a tennis or a soccer. But there's also been um, Research has shown great benefits from lower impact activities too, like maybe a yoga or a Pilates or swimming. And then the other message is mix it up. So don't do the same thing on, on consecutive days. Do your bike routine, do your gym routine, do your new learned skill activity, and then focus on getting that, that 30 minutes a day, that two and a half hours a week. And then, what does all this activity lead to? We're doing lots of different exercises, we're doing lots of different movement-based activities, but why? Um, from an occupational therapy standpoint, we do that to improve what's called our ADL function, or ADLs, and, uh, or, sorry, activities of daily living, um, which I've provided the, these two pictures, which I get lots of feedback from my patients as being difficult. So putting on shoes or putting on a jacket when you do exercises, when you do your functional-based activities, it helps you maintain the joint range of motion and the strength to get down to your feet to put on your shoes. Or it helps you maintain the shoulder strength, the shoulder range of motion to put on a jacket consistently. And that's the goal, to stay as independent as we can for as long a period of time as we can. And then I'm gonna hand this back over to Dana just to make this more confusing for everybody. <laughs> All right, so um, community resources. This is just, we're gonna talk about some of the more popular programs that we see around the Southeast Michigan area. Um, but if you are at all concerned about your ability to um, uh, pr safely participate, like you know your balance isn't great, we highly recommend that you contact a physical or occupational therapist to be evaluated first because they might be able to get your balance well enough to participate in something that perhaps you may be more interested in. So that's just our quick disclaimer. Okay, our first one is LSVT Big and Loud. If you notice in the introduction, we are both LSVT certified therapists, so we're gonna be biased, disclaimer. But um, LSVT, it, it stands for Lee Simmons Voice Therapy. It started off as a loud program to help improve speech, but they learned the same philosophy applied to movement, so they created big. 
Uh, LSVT is taught by PTs and OTs. This is unique about this program compared to some of the other programs we'll talk about here. Uh, you can just walk in and participate, but uh, you must be a licensed physical or occupational therapist to become an LSVT certified instructor. As a result, you need a res uh, an order from your doctor to participate. Um, so that could be as easy as your next doctor's appointment. Just say, hey, I need an extra, I want to participate more in exercise. Can you put in an order? But the philosophy behind LSVT is that you're going to use large amplitude of voice, movements, uh, overemphasizing how you move to recalibrate the brain to stop those small movement patterns. You can find a clinician near you at the lsvtglobal.com website that we included on this slide. You just, once again, search by your zip code and somebody will pop up that's closest to you. Pedaling for Parkinson's is another one that's pretty popular right now. It is an instructor-led stationary bike group. Perk, it's indoors. So um, if you do like to bike, you can safely bike indoors the entire year, you just have to drive to the facility. So the purpose here is to increase your phys physical activity to help combat the motor symptoms that cause Parkinson's disease. These bikes are like spinning, like if you, any of you have participated in a spinning class, they have resistance to them. So throughout the class, you'll increase and decrease your resistance or speed to make it more or less challenging. And once again, you can find out more pro about more programs in your area by going to pedalingforparkinson's.org. Rock Steady Boxing is a program growing in popularity lately. It started in Indianapolis, but they now have 12 locations in Michigan. A year ago, I hadn't even heard of this before, but more and more people are telling, or I'm hearing more and more about it, and some patients absolutely love it. Uh, but, so basically, they use boxing to improve strength, speed, balance, and endurance, but this is not hand-to-hand -hand combat. Do not be alarmed. Like, I will not be fighting you or the, the person teaching the class will not be fighting you. You're using speed bags, um, power bags, to heavy bags to uh, challenge your balance yourself. So the harder you punch, the more you'll have to challenge your balance to stay upright. So it, it's just one more way to, um, that might be more interest to you if you know, biking isn't your thing or something like that. Just one more option. But once again, if you go to rockstudyboxing.org, you can find a spot near you. Uh, turn over to Patrick. So as early as, or as, I guess as late as the early 2000s, um, there has been a focus on movement and, and dance classes for individuals with Parkinson's disease. And one of the biggest ones is the Dance for PT for PD, and we've provided the uh, the link. But there's also many other local options. If you if you look at our slides where it says local movement and dance classes, and follow that link, you'll find maybe some more options that are local to you, and, and that provide you different dance options. And and then also another place that you can find other options for exercise and physical activities are local support groups. Um, you can get that through either their members or sometimes they have different topics on exercise and activity. Uh, we provided the Ann Arbor Parkinson's support group because that's the one that Dana and I are most familiar with. A lot of our patients come from the Ann Arbor Parkinson's support group. Um, it's designed just for patients, for caregivers or both. And we provided a website. This is, this is for, to find a local option more near you because some people in this area would probably have to drive 60, 90, or 120 minutes to get to the Ann Arbor area, and that's just not feasible a lot of the time. And then another exercise option that's been gaining popularity is called PWR. It's a Parkinson's wellness-focused um, exercise activity. The philosophy is similar to LSVT, but it's geared towards people with less functional deficits. So, and it's also, it's an instructor-led course, but the instructor doesn't have to be an OT or a PT. It can be somebody who's very interested in exercise, physical activity, and wants to work with the Parkinson population. Um, I guess in this, in this group, they're consistently uh, changing their program, adding new things based on, on new research that comes out. So their program may be a little more dynamic than others. 
And then I wanted to include this, this kind of slide about the Wii. So this is a patient of mine, and she's participating in balance activities on the Wii. So sometimes we can't get out, you know, getting to um, a rec center or a formalized class or group gets to be difficult. There's things we can do in our own home to help improve our balance, to help improve our coordination, to help improve our endurance. Uh, the Nintendo Wii is a, is a virtual reality-based gaming system that came out probably 10 to 12 years ago. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, it's relatively low price, $150 to $200 for the basic console plus, plus whatever you're going to spend on games. What we're doing here is we're using a balance board and we're interacting with the video game based on the patient's movements. Um, on this game, it's too bad the slide is so small, but she's moving back and forth to keep an object on an, on an iceberg. So she's got to focus and adjust her balance according to the game. But research has also shown improvements in, in not only the physical components of Parkinson's disease, but also some of the executive functioning components of Parkinson's disease um, just based on playing this game. So like I said, it's a great option to do as a home exercise program, to do on days in Michigan where we can't get out, or to do it if, if you're kind of struggling with being able to find a ride or somebody to get you back and forth to classes. There are other options. So other exercise suggestions would be like a lower impact um, activity like Tai Chi or a formal or informal walking and biking programs, yoga, Pilates, a new big thing is aquatic therapy because it is so good on the joints and is much less impact than some of the other activities we've talked about throughout today. Um, once again, there is a link where you can kind of go and do your own research and see what works best for you. And then, oh my goodness, I didn't know those people were moving. Anyways, <laughs> whatever you do, just move. So I know you've kind of heard that throughout the message throughout the day. Whatever it is you participate in, just continue to participate in it. Learn a new skill learn a new activity. All those things will help with both the physical and the non-physical components of Parkinson's disease. And then, you know, the, the take home message is that exercise is a lifelong participation. And I want to just use, just from last week alone, another example from my clinical experience. I did a reeval on a guy who I had seen 18 months ago, and his, his uh, referral was just for one to two weeks to uh, to kind of revamp or look at his home program. And so the first question I asked him was, he actually doing a home program? Because a lot of times the feedback is no. But this guy was pretty honest. He, he does his home program, plus he works out an extra two to three hours a week. And uh, what, I, what I saw was, was pretty cool. So we saw a 15 to 20 pound increase in grip strength. We saw three or four second improvement in, in fine motor skills on both hands and then just overall balance and endurance, endurance improvements. And that's just from the continued participation in activity. You know, it's, it's, the message is, it's not just one thing. You know, there's a bunch of different things we need to do to continue to, continue to be independent and live a high quality of life. And then real quickly, before we get into some stretching and, and a really good home program that we can take home with us is, when do you need to see Dana and I? Like, when is the dividing line when you feel like you're doing good at home and independent, and then maybe you need some help? So one of them is you have a fear of falling during exercise. Um, you've noticed that your arms are not swinging as much. The amplitude in your arm swing is a little bit less than it used to be. Your gait's beginning to slow. It seems like family members are walking away from you. You fatigue more easily, and you need more rest breaks. You're beginning to trip and fall more often. Turning becomes very difficult. You're, freeze, you're freezing more, and freezes are happening more frequently. Uh, retropulsion, like we discussed earlier. And then micrographia, we discussed that earlier as well, where your, your writing starts out larger and continues to get smaller and smaller. And then we're going to talk about uh, if you keep looking in, in the, the packets that were provided, there's actually a large uh, group of stretching activities we're going to go over with you. So at this time, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Dana. I'm going to be the example, and she's going to lead us through some exercises. All right. 
do we want everybody up or do we just want some of them to demonstrate you're be me able to do with us but um, some might be a little challenging specifically the first two because they're using stairs most people at least have like maybe one little step into their house or they can use a step stool but um, it's a calf stretch so these stretches we give commonly to patients with Parkinson's they may not be the best for you, for you if you're feeling like these are too easy or too hard that's another great sign to go see your physical or occupational therapist calf stretches though so you go to the edge of a of a step and drop one heel back let me show you a picture you drop one heel back this is not meant to be a balance challenge. You are meant to hold on. So if this is something that maybe you can't, your house doesn't accommodate, um, once again, a physical or occupational therapist could help you figure that out or maybe you know talk to your spouse. Maybe you guys can come up with it together. Sometimes people get the stretch just as easily by standing against a wall and putting their heel back and holding onto the wall for support. So, but this, this tends to be the best way to stretch your calf. That's why I could only include one picture. A hamstring stretch also decided that it's usually easiest for people on a stair that uh, it's just commonly where I, most of my patients get the best stretch, but you're, you step back still hold on because it's a stretch not a balance exercise and you put your foot up, one foot up on the step the knee needs to be straight so um, and then once the knee is straight you bend forward at the waist till you feel a stretch down the back of your leg uh, hip flexor stretch is the next one and you're over there yep. oh. So all of these, um, you guys have the handout in your packet. So it's not on the slides, but on the handout is how long I want you to hold each stretch. I tried to make it the same for like all the stretches are held around 30 to 60 seconds. All the reps for each are the same. So just as a general take home, you hold your stretches for about 30 to 60 seconds. The next one's the hip flexor stretch. This is really important because, as we said before, the stooped posture is really common. Like you feel like you're being pulled forward. So the muscles in the front get really tight. So uh, the safest way to do this that I have found is to get two chairs, usually in your dining room, basically a chair with no wheels. Don't do anything too crazy. But you put one foot back and bend. So the knee is bent and stand tall while holding onto a chair in front of you and then just lean your hips forward till you feel a stretch. Once again, 30 to 60 seconds. Repeat it on both legs. Not just the side that seems to be more affected by the Parkinson's. Uh, the next one, if you guys wanna participate in this one, it might surprise you, is to do uh, upright posture against a wall. So, find a wall. <laughs> Notice I make the tall guy do it. <laughs> Um, the goal for this one is to stand with your heels, bottom, shoulders, and head all against the wall. And many of you will feel a stretch. So, or fatigue. The, the, the goal is to try and hold this for a minute, but it is not easy. So, the next one's a, neck, a cervical stretch for your neck muscles from the associated forward head that commonly happens from the stooped posture. So uh, the way I teach that is to try to smell your own armpit <laughs> and like turn your head about at that angle and put one hand behind your back and pull the other one down and you should feel a stretch on the side of your neck, maybe even on the back of your shoulder. Just which, look whichever armpit you're looking towards put the opposite arm behind your back yeah it looks like most of you got it good stuff see your naturals all can exercise oh okay it is in there just a little bit further down so this is the doorway the pec stretch in the doorway this is really helpful once again for stretching um, the pecs that really get tight with that stoop posture we couldn't demonstrate that one. There is not a doorway nearly narrow enough. <laughs> Rows. So um, you can do this exercise.
is without a band. If you really want a band, you are more than welcome to go to your physical occupational therapist to get you one, or you can go to any like sporting goods store. They sell them next to usually the exercise balls and yoga mats, um, different colors or different strengths of resistance. But for rows is really good to also help get that upright posture. And the goal is, is to bring your elbows back but squeeze your shoulder blades together. Some people compensate by just rocking back or just thinking they can bring their elbows back, but they haven't actually squeezed their shoulder blades together. That is the important component there. It is in the directions though, so the, the instructions in the handout are, are consistent with what I want you to do. Because this is an, uh, an exercise, not a stretch, I want you to do 15 sets, or 15 reps twice. Sit to stands. So this is a um, common struggle that our patient, Patrick and I's patients, complain about, that they have trouble getting out of chairs on the first try, especially lower chairs or couches, more plush furniture. So the, a great exercise is to find a firmer chair. Please don't start at your couch. You'll get frustrated. Um, to find a firm chair like a dining room chair, also no wheels. Um, and use your arms out in front of you as like a counterbalance. So you lean forward to bring your nose over your toes and try to sit up, or to try to stand up in one motion. And then when you sit down, also you can use your arms as a counterbalance, stick your bottom back, yep, and, and no plopping. Great job. Props to the gentleman in the back. He's great at this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, the next two are, are to be done on a bed, or on your bed or on, a f on the floor if you can safely get there, so don't, no need to try this particular one, um, but hopefully my picture makes sense. This is my modeling debut right now, so I apologize if you're like, I don't get that. <laughs> but bridging, so you, while lying on your bed, you bend your knees up and elevate your pelvis up so it's a straight line. And try and just get it as high as you can, go slowly up and slowly down. Once again, 15 repetitions, and try to do that twice. Also, it, this helps strengthen your glutes and the posterior back muscles so you can uh, stand up taller. And then the last one that we see that we commonly prescribe are clams, uh, clamshells. You hear several different options, but the exercise is laying on your side. You, may, you can use a resistance band if no resistance is too challenging, so I wanted to show it with a resistance band. But if you lie on your side, bend your knees and hips up, and then try and bring your top knee off your bottom knee. It helps strengthen uh, the, the gluteus medius on the side of your hips that helps you stand and keep your balance. So like to perform balance on one leg, which we all have to do every step we take, even though it's brief, you need to be able to have a strong gluteus medius muscle. So that, this is a great exercise for that. So you lay on one side and lift one leg off the bottom, roll to your other side and lift your other knee up. And then finally, Patrick and I wanted to demonstrate a floor transfer because while, while we're optimistic, we're also realists, and we understand that you might get stuck on the floor and then not know what to do. So we did want to demonstrate that really quick in case any of you are experiencing falls. So say you end up on the floor, and maybe it's even in the middle of the room. We recommend that you crawl over to a chair. So get on your hands and knees and crawl over to a, a chair once again, something with no wheels. <laughs> um, but crawl over and put your hands up. Then assume a half kneeling position, which is when you put one foot on the floor and then push to stand and immediately sit in that piece of furniture that you're pushing off of. So then you can like rest, regroup. It's, falling is scary and every patient tells me that half of the time it's spent they spend in the beginning of immediately after their fall is to just get their bearings and figure out what do I even do I can't believe this happened so sit recuperate mentally and physically before you try to stand up and move again so we wanted to leave some time for questions and it looks like we did sweet so do any of you have any questions 
We're that good, huh? Oh. Would we mind doing the floor transfer again? Sure, absolutely. Would you like it with a dramatic fall? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so you're on the floor. You need to get into all, onto all fours and crawl over on your hands and knees over to a chair. Put, one hand, put your hands up on the chair and then go into a half kneeling position, which is when you put one foot on the floor so your knee is in the air. And then you push off the chair to stand up and then sit immediately in the chair that you pushed from. Okay. Uh, so, okay, so it looks like Laura has got a microphone that she'll give to you to ask the question. Yeah, uh, does, us, does someone always have to have a referral from the doctor in order to gain services through you? Yes, to, be, to see a physical or occupational therapist, yes, like just for any exercise program or for LSVT, but some of the other exercise uh, programs we talked about, no, you don't. You just, What would be a good exercise, like a daily thing for like for falling backwards? So that that's a complicated question because, uh, or the complicated answer because many people fall backwards for different reasons. Um, it can be posture, it can be weakness, it could be just a general lack of proprioception, which is knowing where your body is in space. So I attack that problem differently. So I guess I would recommend uh, seeing a physical or occupational therapist. What about you? It, it can also be a, an attention, an attention piece. So just at some point in time, just as you stand up, you continue to move backwards and, and you forget to bring your weight forward. So there's an attention component to it too. So, you know, I've, I've used a technique to try to have my patients talk me through what they're gonna do and, and say out loud just so they can keep their attention. That's a really tough thing because because you never really know when it's gonna happen. Um, I've also read some stuff where if you, if you can catch that moment before it happens and do a sidestep, that that can help. But that's a tough one because I don't know if there's any actual exercise that can, that can decrease that. Yeah. A lot of times though, the reason people, like a thing we see with Parkinson's is that people like stop using their toes for balance. I don't know what it is, but you stay on your heels a lot. So um, it's got, you gotta figure out like why that's happening. So I guess I would recommend seeing somebody like Patrick or I. She's getting her exercise. <laughs> How strongly do you recommend that the Parkinson's patient avoid moving backwards? Uh, like, like stepping backwards when they walk, like just like this? Um, to move from one place to another rather than moving backwards to do a 180 and walk forward rather than backwards so oh. they avoid losing balance. Yeah, so it depends on how far along patients are progressed. Like actually a lot of my patients, if they're not very far along in the progression of the disease, actually do better with stepping backwards rather than turning because turning is also quite a challenge. Um, but we teach strategies on how to turn safely to avoid stepping backwards once you, um, oh, once you progress to that point where stepping backwards would be far too dangerous. <laughs> so it sounds like the exercises that you were showing us are the ones that you would recommend on a daily basis, is that correct? Correct, yeah, yep. For stuff um, that is uh, more balance related, it really is, and even if you know you go to a neurological physical therapist, feel free to take this handout, but they might say, you know, some of these exercises, you're, don't, you're like, you're too good. Like, these are too easy for you. Let me give you some of these, like, there really is science behind the exercises PTs and OTs prescribe, so, um, yeah, these, these are just generally what we find to be really helpful. Um, that we assign often to our Parkinson's patients. Hi, uh, my question is from looking at all the exercises, it's for the patients who are still mobile. 
and they can walk or like that, whatever stretches you showed us. Once it's advanced that they are in wheelchair and they get a prescription from a doctor for LSVT, is it going to be helpful? Uh, that's a great question. So, you know, because there is a large standing component to LSVT and a large balance component, uh, some of those exercises wouldn't be relevant. Uh, there is, uh, there, there are some exercises that are completed from a, seating, a seated position, you know, three or four of those. And so from an endurance standpoint, from an amplification of movement standpoint, there may be some benefit, but, uh, you know, from a balance and, and safety standpoint, you may not uh, receive as much of the benefit as you would once you're, versus an ambulatory or, or a, a patient who's standing. At that point, LSVT isn't like what we would recommend, but still you could get an order for physical and occupational therapy and we can find lower level exercises and activities for them to do. The question is once they have the prescription for LSVT, we take to the therapist. Will the therapist guide us like what should we be doing next? Yep, definitely. Correct. A lot of times we, we get people who are in a wheelchair and, and we'll just send a quick email, at least in the U of M system, we'll send a quick email back to the doctor and say, LSVT may not be the most appropriate way to proceed, but mm -hmm. we do have other exercises and other activities to offer. Yeah, just a more traditional physical and occupational therapy plan of care. Yep. Earlier you said you can help prevent stooping over that happens as Parkinson's disease progresses using the hip flexor stretch. I'd like to see that and is there another just, um, exercise that also helps maintain the upright posture once? Sure, so the standing against the wall is great, but the reason I specifically said the hip flexor stretch is because if you've been stooping for a long time, that muscle gets tight because it's shortened when you sit and it's shortened when you stand. So it never really gets stretched, like you can't physically get that high anymore. Did you wanna see that stretch one more time? So the chairs are facing both direct or the same direction. And then one leg's up. And then you one leg up resting on the chair and using your hands for a balance on the chair in front of you. And uh, it definitely challenged my balance, so definitely put your hands on the chair in front of you. And if you want a bigger stretch, you can push your hips forward. On the um, home exercises that you have in the pamphlet, how much time would it take to run through that? About 15 minutes. What do you recommend for Parkinson's patients when they ultimately have difficulty climbing stairs and don't have, you know, needed to do that in their home? Um, so are you, are you saying, so you've reached the point where unable to do stairs or the goal is still to try to? The goal is still to try, but you're having, uh, you don't have all the strength and you can only like go halfway or something. Is there a gadget or would you do it on all fours? Would that be a safer so, way to? Oh. I would, uh, me professionally, I, I would really struggle with advising somebody to do that on all fours. Um, I would, at that point in time, I would definitely start to look for more, um, some more compensatory strategies. So maybe some home modifications. There are stair glides and there are companies that install them and stuff like that. Just to, because you're really putting yourself in an unsafe situation when you start looking at going up on stairs on all fours. So, you know, once you've kind of reached that point, plus you could spend a lot of, um, you know, you could spend a lot of your, your energy trying to get up the stairs and you're not going to have energy for other things. So, you know, kind of taking that stairs climbing piece and, and going down piece out may be the best way to proceed. I assume handrails are installed already? Okay, yeah. Um, some people, they move their bedrooms down to the main level. So then that way that they have like everything they need on one level. For
for safety too. But yeah, that's the unfortunate thing is some people start to think about down the line, you know, if they move, like what would be a better setup for them? Yeah. But the stair lifts are a great option too, the seated chair lifts. But they're um, like around five to eight grand, just so you know. I'm going to put in a plug for um, if you have a social worker at your clinic where you see your neurologist or if you can connect with a community-based organization and think in terms of pre-planning so that you're not sort of trying to respond to a situation that you've already put things in place kind of prior to the time of actually needing it. How do you, how do you incorporate yoga? How do you incorporate yoga into your daily exercise program? I'm, I'm sorry, one more time? Yoga. 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 Oh. Um, well, I don't do yoga. <laughs> I don't know about you, but. <laughs> um, I, I try to incorporate stretches, which is a big component of yoga. But um, I, we personally teach LSVT. So that, that but we'll, we teach like tr more traditional therapy stretches as well. But, um, I guess I don't. I guess I don't know how to answer your question about yoga because I'm. I don't do yoga personally. Um, uh, where would we go to see about doing the boxing? Like we have a Y membership, and I don't think that they have. Would that yeah. be a class or an? Um... So on the web, there's a website that we included on this slide for rock steady boxing. Um, rocksteadyboxing.org and if you go there they, you just put their, their uh, website is actually really easy to navigate you can put in your zip code and find ones near you yep what uh, how about weights working with weights or weight lifting we highly recommend it <laughs> um, but just don't do so much that it um, affects your negatively impacts your balance or that you can only do a couple reps you should be able to do at least 15 to 20 reps of an exercise that you do your guy just I don't I'm hoping at least that you guys' goal in light in strength training right now is to not be a big old bodybuilder if it is disregard what I'm saying right now but if it isn't and you want to really improve your muscle tone and balance or, and uh, endurance you need to do more reps lower weight but it is the strength training is beneficial on a variety of levels. Helps with bone density. So, I I I belong to Rocksteady Boxing in Troy, mm -hmm. and it's a it's an excellent program. It really Great. gets you going. Great. See, positive. There's one in Troy. <laughs> Is there a website you could recommend for demonstration of exercises to improve fine motor skills? Oh, that's a good question. A, a website to, to demonstrate that. I, I don't know of one off the top of my head. Um, you know, if you were looking just to do a, a quick Google search, I bet you if you went into Google and just typed in fine motor skills, training and it would probably lead you to a video or two of some occupational therapists doing fine motor skills training um, you know if that's your goal that is one of the things that you could see a, a physician for a neurologist for that could get you a referral to an OT and they could do a few sessions on uh, home program based activities that would focus on fine motor skills oh you did it oh Apparently there are videos. <laughs> <laughs> you can YouTube anything. My question is that it seems like uh, last uh, three years I have gone from walking to wheelchair. Or should I go back so I can go back wheelchair to walking? Is it possible? Is it possible? So uh, your question is, is you went from, it seemed like in the last year, you went from a walker to a wheelchair kind of quickly, and you're wondering how, if you can go back to the walker? Oh, great question. Um, 
So I really would recommend more traditional physical and occupational therapy for you. There are all sorts of pieces of equipment that we have for people of a variety of um, uh, physical impairments, even lower levels. So there's things like standing frames that support you in standing. So even like the feeling of weight bearing through your feet has probably gone, like your ability to do that has become really impaired. Like you're not aware of your body over your feet anymore. Um, there's uh, some clinics have, I'm, I'm speaking to the one I work at in particular, sorry for the bias, um, but we have a, a a robotic treadmill uh, with robotic legs that can help people stand and walk again. Um, not to so, I mean, the, there's research to show some functional carryover, but it is limited because it is of the progressive nature of the disorder. But we definitely work on that, improving standing tolerance, um, even at starting walking, taking a few steps, just to anything to help improve someone's quality of life. I just want to say some of your local hospitals may have an integrative medicine department which would have therapeutic yoga or other programs. So check out the complementary or integrative medicine departments and see what they have to offer. Um, if anyone lives around the Ann Arbor area, the Briarwood Mall, the University of Michigan has a senior exercise program. Uh, Monday through Friday from 9 to 12, they have the armchair yoga, they have Zumba, and then they have regular Monday, Wednesday, Friday uh, exercise classes. They last from 9 to 10, and then Saturday it's at 8 to 9. And they also have wall ma mall walking. <laughs> at the Briarwood Mall, yeah, yeah. All right, well, thanks so much for you guys' attention and participation with the exercises and everything. Uh, we'll be sticking around for a little while yet, so if you have any questions, feel free to come up and ask. <laughs>